Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, come on, man. We can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Another wonderful day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. How many of y'all are excited about today? I know I am. We have, we've got a wonderful treat for you today in our service. We have a wonderful speaker of the hour. I'm going to uh, introduce her a little bit later in the program, and I, I feel honored that she has accepted uh, this chance to go ahead and get to know us over here at 11th Street. We're excited about it. We always start our services off by uh, going ahead and reading out of scripture and I see on the program they basically took care of the scripture for me, you know, which I'm thankful of. <laughs> I'm thankful of because I try to change it up from time to time and get us to uh, go ahead and go into the word of God and begin to see what he has out there for us. Our scripture reading today will come from Galatians, the fourth, I mean the third chapter, beginning at verse 21. And I'm going to read all the way down to verse 29. Uh, Galatians, the third chapter, verses 21 through 29. And if you could stand to your feet and give reverence to the word of God, I appreciate it and even if you don't have your Bibles if you can stand would you please do so Galatians the third chapter beginning at verse 21 and it reads as follows is the law then against the promises of God God forbid for if there had been a law given which could have given life verily righteousness should have been the law, by the law but the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe but before faith came we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. May God add a supernatural blessing to the reading and hearing of his eternal word. That's such a wonderful passage of scripture because it lets us know that we are in the promises of God. And being that we are his children and are in his promises, we don't have to struggle and worry about all of these things that are happening all around us. Because if we know in this day and age that we're living in right now, we know that we're living in a trying time, a time that has caused so much strife. There are so many problems happening around us each and every day. But isn't it good to know that God is still in control? That's the thing. That's the message that that scripture basically tells to us is that God is in control. And it doesn't matter because he's in control and he has no respected people. He's our God, yes. each and every one of us. Yes. So we should remember that when we talk to the people that are out there in the highways and byways and we compel them to go ahead and come to Christ. Yes. I'm going to ask our 
deacons to come up front and go ahead and lead us in devotional. And they can do whatever they feel like doing. Say good morning again to everybody. Good morning. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to read a familiar scripture this morning. I'm going to read a familiar scripture this morning, and we're going to do a song and a prayer. And it comes from the 23rd Numbers of Psalms. And it reads, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley. Now listen to that part. Say, yea, though I walk through the valley, through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepareth a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I have read to you verses 1 through 6 from Psalm 23. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and to the hearers of his word. The Lord is blessing me right now, oh, right now. We know that you can fix it. Yes. And we just ask 
that you fix it for us. Help us to be what you would have us to be. Lead us and guide us in the way you'd have us to go. We know that you're God. You've got it all by yourself. And you don't make mistakes. So by saying that, Lord, we're going to ask that you would just continue to do what you're doing and help us to be more loving and more kind towards each other. In your name we pray. Amen. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me.
But ain't it good to know that God is still in the blessing business and he's in control of everything. Now it's time for our offering. I'm going to turn you over into the hands of the ushers to come around and
Yeah, man, y'all, y'all must have known that we have a, a special guest in the, the building today. Uh, I've got this humbling task of introducing our speaker of the hour today. And this is just a, a wonderful privilege and a wonderful honor to go ahead and introduce someone of this caliber to come and speak to us today. Our speaker of the hour today is Dr. Christine Holt. Dr. Christine Holt is currently the Chancellor at the University of Arkansas, Hope, Texarkana. Amen. Now one of the reasons that it just excites me to even think about it is that I was reading and I was trying to, you know, collect a little information on her and, um, you know, find out more. I've heard wonderful things from everybody, but I like to go and try to research it for myself and then try to find out a few things. And uh, I heard that you're the first African-American female to be leading an institution like this in the state of Arkansas. Man, that, that's enough to be excited about. I remember talking to her on a, 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 a week or so ago, and I basically asked her, you know, well, kind of tried to tell her and warn her about us because we're, we're just a small, peaceable <laughs> country church and she said hey look I'm okay with, with with that because she comes from a part of Georgia I, I didn't even actually get her uh, get all the information about what part of Georgia you were from my parents are from Georgia your parents are from Georgia Fort so yeah. Fort Valley Fort yeah. Valley okay 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 she's from Fort Valley Georgia well our family is from uh, Fort Valley Georgia so she understands those humble beginnings and uh understands what it's like to go ahead and go out into the world and and you have to depend on God to go ahead and bless what you've been given. On September the 1st, 2021, she was made the first black woman to lead a public higher education institution in the state of Arkansas. She has previously served, now listen to this, Daddy. <laughs> I'm going to run down this briefly. Uh, she previously served as the chief of staff for the University of Missouri system. The associate provost for the University of Missouri at Columbia. Dean of Academic Administration from Northern Virginia Community College. Interim Dean of Learning and Technology Resources from NOVA. The Interim Dean of Students at NOVA, the Interim Provost at NOVA, Executive Director of the Catawba Valley Community College, Career Development Coordinator from the Cuyahoga Valley Career Center, CVCC, the Human Resource Development Coordinator for the Montgomery Community College, Site Coordinator and Workplace Literacy Instructor for Randolph Community College, Workplace Literally Literacy Instructor for Central Carolina Community College, and she's an attorney at law. Oh, yes. Yes. Dr. Holt earned a Doctor of Business Administration at the University of Missouri at St. Louis, and also holds a Juris Doctorate from Cleveland State University, a Master of Arts in adult education from East Carolina University and a Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration from Capital University. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying not to go. You know, you know I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to just be ordinary up here, but Dr. Holt, it's an honor and a privilege uh, for us to welcome you here. Uh, we, we thank you from the bottom of our heart that you're going to come and speak to us today. And 
We want you to feel at home and feel like you can come in your own way. Whatever it is that, that, that you need from us, go ahead and let us know. And, and, and you go ahead and come in your own way.
here in Maysville, South Carolina. She was the last of her parents' children. She was one of 17. After the Civil War, her mother worked for her former owner until she could buy the land in which family was cotton. And by age nine, Mary McLeod Bethune could pick 250 pounds of cotton. Can you imagine that young people, first of all, picking cotton, and then saying, yeah. oh, picking cotton. Yeah. Yeah. So that was amazing. She was able to benefit from efforts to educate African Americans after the war. She graduated from a seminary, a boarding school in North Carolina. She next attended Moody's Institute for Home and Foreign Missions in Chicago because she wanted to be a missionary. And guess what? At that time, no church would sponsor her as a missionary. So she decided to become an educator. And I'm very grateful that she decided to become an educator. She moved to Florida, where she worked as the where she worked at the Presbyterian Church, church and sold insurance. In 1904, she had been married. Her marriage didn't work out, but she was determined to support her son. So she decided that she would open a boarding school. And the school was located in Daytona. It was the Daytona Beach Literary and Industrial School for Training Negro Girls, as we were called at that time. <coughs> Eventually, the school became a college. It actually merged with another school. So her school was for all girls, and the school that it merged with was Cookman College, and it was for all boys. And that happened in 1929, and they issued their first degrees in 1943. So can you imagine what that must have been like, the amount of courage and faith, there goes that word again, faith, she had to go from picking cotton as a young girl to no church sponsoring her as a missionary to starting her own boarding school for girls. That's faith. That's faith. So then let's go back and let's talk, at the, talk about the next of those dimensions. So we talked about faith. Now let's talk about hope. When I think of hope, how do you define hope? Well, hope is many things. Hope, when I think about hope, it's not only a noun, but it's also a verb. A noun, it means confident trust with the expectation, there goes that word again, of fulfillment. The scripture here that I'd like to, for you to think about is scriptures give us encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. So not everything will not happen overnight. You won't see it in an instant. And when I think about our forefathers, our foremothers, they understood this scripture as they fought for voting rights and against substandard housing and subpar job opportunities so that those of us who came after them would have a better future and would benefit from a better life. And here I think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of his last speeches that he gave. I may not get to the promised land with you, but we shall get to the promised land. Yeah. We shall get to the promised land. As a verb, hope means to desire with expectation of obtaining them. Romans 8, 24, 25. If we already have something, then we don't have to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have. We must wait patiently, there goes that word, patiently and confidently. Young people, I want you to know, what is easy is seldom excellent. So in other words, when things are given to you, or you don't have to work for them, you don't always value or appreciate those things. Let me give you a very concrete example of something that happened to me when I was younger. I, in my sophomore year of college, many of my friends during my freshman year, they brought their own cars to school. Well, I didn't have a car to bring to school. So I bugged my father all summer long my sophomore year. Well, actually, the beginning of the sophomore year, before the sophomore year. And I would bug him every morning. I would run down, and those times you had a newspaper. I don't know if you still get those newspapers home, and I would, look, I would look at the ad section in the newspaper, and I would look for cars, and I would highlight things and slide them over my father and slide back. No. So finally, one morning, he said yes, and I immediately ran, got his key so that we could go and take a look at the car. Now, by the end of the day, I thought I had a pretty good chance of getting the car because he allowed me to drive the car home. His mechanic checked it out, and he said, "Well, I tell you what." If you want this car, you have to buy it. Uh, what? <laughs> that wasn't what I was expecting of him. I thought he was going to buy that car for me. He did not do that. What he said was, if you want this car, then you buy it. At the time, the dealer told me it was going the payment was going to be about sixty dollars a month. Sixty dollars a month for eighteen months. For my dream car, it was a nineteen eighty Buick Scout. Anyway, so. <laughs> So, he did not buy the car. He told me if I wanted it, I had to buy the car. Well, as I said, I wasn't going to buy it because the dealer said it's going to be $60. It's actually $81. But I went ahead and bought it. And 
I thought about it because that would allow me to show my father, one, that I could budget my money and pay for the note for 18 months, and I could be responsible and pay it on time. So I really valued that car, truth be told, a lot more that he did not give it to me. I had to work for it and earn it on my own. So that's what hope teaches us. We have to wait patient. Things don't always happen overnight. When I, so that was a good example of hope. The third dimension is love. And again, it's the greatest of the ones that were mentioned. Love means to hold dear, devotion or tenderness for, to feel affection. And one of my childhood scriptures in Sunday school was John 3.16. We could all rattle that one off. For God loves the world so much so that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This same love is reiterated in 1 John 3.18. Let's not really say that we love each other, but let us show the truth by our actions. When I think of love, I think of one of my sheroes. And my shero, in this case, is Barbara Jordan. Young people, do you know Barbara Jordan? You need to know BJ, as I like to affectionately call her. Barbara Jordan was born in Houston in 1936. Her childhood life centered around the church. Her mother was a teacher in the church, and her father was a Baptist church, preacher. And through her mother, Jordan was the great granddaughter of Edward Pat, who was one of the last African American members of the Texas House of Representatives prior to disenfranchisement of black Texans under Jim Crow. Barbara Jordan was the youngest of three children. So we see her pattern for me. Barbara Jordan was the youngest. He was the first one that I talked about, but she was also the youngest. Very good. All right. So here's what Jordan did. She credited a speech she heard in high school years was inspiring her to become an attorney. And because of segregation, she could not attend the University of Austin, University of Texas at Austin. Now that's hard to believe in this day and age, but she couldn't because she was black or African American. She could not attend the University of, of Texas at Austin. So instead, she attended Texas Southern University. It's a historically black college university. She majored in political science and history. And at TSU, Jordan was a national champion debater. She loved to debate. She was able to defeat opponents from Yale and Brown, and even tied one from Harvard. She graduated with the highest honors, and then she went on to law school in 1959. In 1972, she was elected to the US House of Representatives, the first woman elected in her own right to represent Texas. In 1974, she made an influential televised speech before the House Judiciary Committee, supporting the impeachment of then President Richard Nixon. In 1976, Jordan mentioned as a possible running mate for president, or running mate, vice president, to Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. So that was before Kamala Harris. She became instead the first African American woman to deliver a keynote address at the Democratic National Convention. And despite not being a candidate, she went on to receive one delegate vote, 0.03% for president at the convention. And that was pretty monumental for today. So as you can see, when we talk about love, and I think of love here in the passion that she had for her talent, which was oration, being able to stand up in front of people and give speeches. So she aligned her passion and her pursuits with what she did for a career. So she spoke, she became a great debater, a great lawyer, and then she went on into politics to serve people. So Barbara Jordan is the she epitomizes love for me. She is my shero. I remember in fifth grade, my teacher allowed me to, we had to pick people. And she actually, she did not allow me to pick the person. She picked Barbara Jordan. At first, I was a little upset about that. But I got over it once I was able to read about what she did. And she really did inspire me. So that's Barbara Jordan. She is love. So when I think about the next characteristic that I'd like to talk with you about, I want to talk about knowledge. Knowledge, and this is the fourth one that I actually added, if you recall. So knowledge really connotes a fact or a condition of being aware of something, or having information, or being learned, a scholar, possessing wisdom. As an educator, it is important to be mindful in the words of the legendary African-American poet, Maya Angelou. Nobody ever cares how much you know until you show how much you care. So that ties back into love and showing and caring for others. And what I gleaned from this is knowledge is important, but knowledge for knowledge's sake is not important unless you use it for good to help others through your life and through your caring for others. So when I think of 
a book of the Bible that provides instruction for how we live our daily lives. I think of Proverbs. And Proverbs usually, Proverbs talks about knowledge. And there's three, three scriptures that I'd like to provide for you here and here. The first one is Proverbs 14, 6. Knowledge comes easily to those with understanding. Proverbs 18, 15. Intelligent people are always ready to learn. Their ears are open for knowledge. And the last one is Proverbs 23, 12. Commit yourself to instruction. Listen carefully to words of knowledge. Young people, listen carefully to your elders. Listen to ways to improve yourself. And one of those ways is by pursuing a degree or post-secondary credential as a way to help improve not only your life, but the life of the people around you and for generations to come. So when I think of knowledge, I have one more person in history that I'd like to share with you. And this is a person who started her life not far from here. And that is Dorothy McFadden Hooper. I know Missy has heard of her. Anyone else heard of Dorothy McFadden Hooper? Well, how many of you saw the movie Hidden Figures? Can you guys see that movie? Well, she was whole Arkansas's own hidden figure. She actually was born in Hope, Arkansas, July 18, July 1st, 1918. She was born to her parents, William and Elizabeth McFadden. She was the granddaughter of enslaved people and the youngest of four children. Okay, so here's your test. Who were the other two that was the youngest of their siblings? So we talked about Dorothy McFadden Hoover, Barbara Jordan. You got it. Very good. Good. So after graduating high school, at the age of 15, she enrolled at Arkansas Agricultural Mechanical and Normal College, AMNN. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Math, two months shy of her 20th birthday. Talk about remarkable. That's remarkable. After teaching for a few years in Georgia, she received her master's degree in mathematics from Atlanta University in 1943. She was then hired as the predecessor of NASA, which was National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And while there, she was a professional mathematician. She was a part of a class of women, both black and white, hired to work as quote unquote human computers and aid the development of aeronautical technology during the Second World War. So originally, she was in a segregated region. So she, they had black women, they had white women, and then they had white women. They were all segregated. And then her assignment moved from the segregated unit that she was in so, because she showed such promise, which led her to be one of the first human computers to be asked to join an integrated research group. She then worked directly with a NASA engineer known as Robert Jones, who was one of the premier aeronautical engineers of the 20th century. And by 1946, she was completing calculations and was wi widely relied on by Jones. Her work was increasingly recognized as important to the aeronautics field. So the thing that I want you to remember about Fat Hoover, she certainly was learned, she was a scholar, and she was an intelligent person. She was always looking to improve herself, going back to get additional degrees and additional knowledge so that she could contribute in a great way. So young people, I want you to remember that as you move forward in your own journey. Now, the other thing, this is where, you know when you go to the movies, and before the movie comes on, what do they show? Preview. Right? A little preview, right? <laughs> well, well, here comes your preview. So knowledge, again, this gives me an opportunity to talk about UAHT. So I want to answer some questions for you. So when I think of knowledge, as part of that definition, one way to exhibit knowledge is to, by sharing information. So I'm going to share some information with you. I'm going to answer one new question four what questions, and one why question. So here are the questions. Who am I? I don't have to answer the next question, because Pastor's already done that job for me. What prepares me to serve as chancellor? What is the purpose of higher education? What do we offer at UAHT? The subtext or the sub-question to that is, what makes us unique? What are we known for? What will we become? So the previous question addresses, what are we currently? What will we become? Looks at where do we want to go in the future? And then lastly, I'm going to appeal to you why you want to become a student at UAHT. Let me also say that some of you may be thinking it's just for young people. I will tell you, learning is lifelong. Lifelong learning. So we have something, that's the beauty of the community college to me, is we offer some, something for every phase and stage in life. So for those of you who'd like to earn a degree or a credential, we have that. 
For those of you who are interested in taking courses that are just fun courses, such as cooking or cake decorating, or things that will just expand the mind, expand the mind we offer that too. And by the way, we also work with business and industry to be able to provide workforce training. So we run the full gamut of what we offer. So the first question is, who am I? So you've heard a lot about what prepares me. So let me just tell you a little bit more about who I am. First generation college student. My parents, as you've heard, are from Georgia. And they're from Fort Valley, Georgia. Any of you know Fort Valley? There's actually a college in HBCU in Fort Valley, Fort Valley State University. My parents tried. I tried to get me to go to Fort Valley. I refused because I was going to have to live with my grandmother. <laughs> I did take that option, but I did, but I did go on to college. But first generation college student. My dad had to leave school in ninth grade. He was one of nine, so he migrated to the north for a better life. He stayed in contact with my parents and each other as children. They played outside. I don't know where they were playing, but they were playing outside. And my grandmas went to church together. So they stayed connected, and my father went back 10 years later to get my mother to marry him, and they moved to Ohio, which is where I was born. But I tell you that story because my dad was a mathematical genius. He knew math. And I think, but for the era in which he grew up, he could have been a financial planner, an actuary, an accountant. But for that era, he didn't have the opportunity that, that UAHT offers so many students today. My mother did finish high school, and she was a great supporter, both of them understood what education meant, and they were very instrumental in making sure that I stayed in school and that I did well. So first generation college student, certainly as you would imagine, staunch advocate for education. I believe I've seen the transformative power, I'm sure many of you in this room have seen the transformative power of higher education. As you heard, I'm a former practicing attorney, guardian of items, Form, practicing attorney. <laughs> but I will say that in my practice, the, I did help the underserved and the underrepresented children and adults. I'm also a trailblazer, as you also heard. So not only in my current role, but both when I was in school during the formative years and later, and even in my career. So in, while I was in school, I was the valedictorian of my very, we were part of the very first graduating class. It was a school focused on law and public service. And that's where I really honed my skills for public service. I do believe in the quote that's attributed to Mary Wright Edelman, service is the rent that we pay for living. I firmly believe that. And I learned it there at Law and Public Service because we gave a lot to the community. The other thing that I should tell you young people is I had a teacher, an eighth grade teacher. I wanted to go to the School of Performing Arts. I wanted to be the next great Sisley Tyson. <laughs> so I did, I had an audition at the school, and we were supposed to audition in two categories. Well, I can definitely not play an organ like you would play, so I didn't really have a second talent. So I was on the waiting list. So I was like, how dare they put me on the waiting list? So I was really upset about that. But again, my mother, along with my eighth grade teacher, they were kind of in cahoots with one another. They knew about this new school, and my mother talked with my eighth grade teacher. And I firmly believe that she had something to do with me getting into Law and Public Service in of High School, and that was the best possible option for me. I didn't know what was good for me, but thank goodness I had people around me and surrounding me knew what was good for me. Mm -hmm. so, so that's how I started out, first graduating class, first valedictorian of this school. Now fast forward to many years later, the, I won't say the end of my formal, well I can say the end of my formal education, but not the end of my education, end of earning degrees faster. <laughs> so, my, my most recent degree is a doctorate in business administration. I was a part of the first class there, class of 12, and I was the only woman in the class. Mm -hmm. So there's something about being a trailblazer that is appealing to me, because you chart your own path in people, and I want you to think about that. What does that look like for you? So, trailblazer, servant leader, although I have to ask people like Missy and people that I work with every day, because as a servant leader, I believe in being collaborative and consensus building. And I hope that that's true. I hope that's what we're building in UAHT. Huge sports fan. So you can imagine today is a wonderful day in my life, right? So I'm from Ohio. Even though I'm not from Cincinnati, it's still in Ohio, barely. It's really close to Kentucky. Any of you have been in the airport in Cincinnati, it really is in Kentucky, but that's okay. We're playing in Cincinnati today. Huge sports fan. Basketball number one, football number two, and when the World Series is playing, I'm a baseball fan. <laughs> so, so what, what can we learn from sports? 
And what I like to tell young people is we learn a number of things. We learn how to be a leader. Mm -hmm. We learn how to, how to work in a team. And we learn how to build consensus and community. Last thing, I'm a traveler. I love to travel. So you can imagine the last few years have been really difficult for me, both domestically and international travel. We were planning a trip to Dubai in 2020. And at some point, I'm hoping that we're still going to be able to pick that trip up. Uh, but love to travel. So those are just some things that you should know about me. The other thing that you've already heard, and I won't go back over the things that you've heard about what prepares me to be a um, chancellor, but I will highlight just a few of those positions. One is a chief, as, a chief, as a chief of staff. So in that role, I had an opportunity to be the right hand of the president. So what I tell young people is, if there's a career that you're interested in, find someone who does that role and attach yourself at the hip if you have to with that person to learn what that means. What kind of training do you need? What kind of experience? What do you have to be good at to be in that kind of role? So I had the privilege of serving as chief of staff to our president. And really, I was in all kinds of meetings. We were strategizing. We were talking. We were listening. I was the confidant. So it was a great way for me to learn for three years by sitting with the president what it means to be a president and or a chancellor of the university. So chief of staff was a great position. The other one that I will highlight is I had a number of interim roles. Young people, I will tell you that get to the room, have a seat at the table, and then being willing to do some things that other people won't do, just so that you can show that you have an interest, and so people can see what kinds of skills and abilities you have. And that's what I was able to do as an interim. So I've had a number of interim roles, as you heard. And what that meant was that I caught the eye of someone who said, you know what, she can be a functional player, a utility player. If you need someone to, she's willing to do that. Now, I tell you that, but I don't want you to compromise your values, your integrity, but come to the table and be prepared. And as you see those roles, be willing to take those on. And sometimes I talk to young people about having internships. And sometimes those internships are not paid, but you should consider those because of the skills that you can acquire that then could lead to an opportunity down the line. So, so that's another job. Interval. Then lastly, my legal career. And people are saying, but, but you don't practice anymore. No, I don't practice anymore, but I developed a lot of transferable school skills that I use every day in my day work. So for example, reading and reviewing contracts, I learned that as an attorney. Dealing with personnel issues, I learned that as an attorney. So you develop and acquire transferable skills. Because you know that in this lifetime, you know, back in my, when my dad was working, he retired from one place after 45 years. That's very rare in this day and age. So you're going to have to develop those skills where you can move and develop those marketable skills where you can move back and forth, you can create your own opportunities. But the way to do that is having those transferable skills that you'll get from your various assignments. So what I hope you can see is my journey has not been a direct path. It has had many twists and turns, a winding path, but what that means is I can relate to our students. Many of our students at UAH, too, that's true for them. They may start and stop. They may have credits from here and credits from there. So what I can do is I can relate to what their experiences are. And I hope what they can see is that they can chart their own path and follow a non-traditional and fun career track because of preparation and work ethic. So these assignments have equipped me to, to serve as chancellor at UAH. So now, Speaking in general terms, what is the purpose of higher education? So when we think of higher education, education, having an educated society increases our opportunity to have a prepared workforce, a thriving economy, and can impact the quality of life for individuals and families. So what I want you to think about is that as a college graduate or having a post-secondary credential, you're more likely to earn more on average. The more likely to enjoy your job. And what I tell young people again is realize that you start in your job career usually in your late teens and early 20s. You may have to work until your mid 60s. You can do the math really quickly. That's over 40 years. So if you're going to have to work that long, you want to make sure it's in a field that you like and you enjoy. So make sure you find job satisfaction. You're more likely to be financially savvy, have a bank account, a savings plan, a retirement plan, and not live paycheck to paycheck more likely to own your own home, tend to live longer, and as a result, your overall health is better. And in the church, we really like this one, Pastor. What it usually gives us is more disposable income. So that means we can give more readily of our time, talent, and treasure to the church and other civic organizations. 
Now, I've mentioned a lot about the economic aspects of being a college graduate or having a post-secondary credential, but it's really more than that. A college or university has an important role in developing an educated person to create an inquiring mind, and not just to develop a highly skilled workforce. Ultimately, education is for civilization, democracy, and a just society. So what do we offer at UHG? What makes us unique? Well, one of the things that I hope we are known for is our academic quality, our excellence. We provide academic rigor for those who are planning to go on and pursue a four-year degree or beyond. And we provide practical relevance for those who are planning to go directly into the world of work at an affordable cost. And the good thing is you don't have to sacrifice quality for affordable costs. We are the most affordable in terms of tuition in the state of Arkansas. We're also affiliated with the University of Arkansas. We have many two-year and four-year schools across the state. So, uh, that includes Fayetteville and also Little Rock. Now, I have to say, if you don't know this, I say this to parents because you can help your children understand this. One of the best things that I hear about constantly as I'm out talking to people is we have an opportunity. If you finish your degree with us and you decide to transfer on to Fayetteville, you pay the same tuition at Fayetteville as you do at UAHT. You should be excited about that because that is a significant savings. So let me give you a picture. So at UAHT, on average, tuition is about $4,000. Tuition at most four-year universities is about $8,900. So you can do the math and see that over that period of time, that is a tremendous savings. So parents get really excited about it. Children not so much until they see the end game. And then sometimes they get excited, sometimes they don't. But the parents are the ones who really get excited about that. Strategically, we're located in two locations down the I-30 corridor. Our first campus <coughs> in 1965 in Hope. And 10 years ago, we celebrated our 10th anniversary this year. We started in Texarkana. We also have a new workforce building that's going up. By next year, we should be in the building. We're really proud of that. We also, for those of you who may be interested in making a knife, we have a lace making school in historic Washington. So, and you would be amazed at how much you can get for making one of those knives. Thousands of dollars for a knife. We have some unique programs. Funeral services. The joke is here, people are dying to get in. <laughs> it is, it's a booby program for us. It's a booby program for us right now. And I had the opportunity just this week to meet a student who was an older student, a non-traditional student probably, I'm guessing, maybe in his late 20s or early 50s. He was coming out of the military and realized that he wanted something to supplement his income, so he went through the program. And by going through the program, now he's opened up. I think he took on a business in Louisville. And so now he's running his own funeral home. And most of he just completed the program in 2020. And what I'm most proud of, Pastor, is that he's coming back to give to others. It's that caring for others. He's paying it forward. He's offering a scholarship. And not only is he offering a scholarship, but he's offering opportunities for young people who are interested or anyone who's interested to have some work based experience. One of the things he said to me is he didn't have a family member in the business. And as you know, most funeral homes are family owned businesses. So he had a hard time getting in. He said he didn't want that to happen to other students, so he's going to provide that opportunity for other students to take advantage of. We also have a new solar program. As we look at solar energy, heating our homes, we're going to see that more and more. We'll offer programs for students to be able to do that. We're hearing more and more in the news about companies moving in, and we're equipping our students to be able to go out, be competitive, and earn a really good wage. The other thing that I should tell you, as I mentioned earlier, we also offer opportunities not just to students, but also to the workforce. We offer things such as forklift training and other courses, customized courses based on the need of employers. We're also looking at developing business and entrepreneurs. So we know that some people want to work for themselves, but want to be able to provide those opportunities to get those skills so that if that's your interest, you'll be able to do that. The last thing that I'll tell you that we're really proud of is our textbook room process. If you are like me, when I was a business major, a hundred years ago, the textbooks were really expensive. And one of the things that we've been able to do is textbook rental. So students are allowed to, are able to rent books at $20 per credit hour. Most courses are three credit hours, so you pay $60. So at the time, a hundred years ago, during the dinosaur age, when I was paying $150 for an accounting textbook, in this day and age, I don't have to pay $60 for that textbook. So that is a huge savings for our students. 
We began the program in 2015, and our students have been able to save about $4 million over the years, or about $460 per semester. So that's a tremendous savings. So let me just tell you quickly what UAHT will become. There are several things that UAHT will become in the future, and we've already started on this path. One is we're going to be an exemplar or paragraph of academic excellence and student success. We have to be. Our students deserve that. We will continue to work on that <coughs> there. We'll be known as the premier choice for workforce training. We will have employers beating down our door because they know once they get one of our graduates, they have a stellar graduate and they'll work more of our graduates because of their skills, their abilities, and their interest in getting work done. We want to ensure our transfer students, so students who start with us and then transfer on to any four-year university, we want to make sure that they are prepared and will do as well academically as if they started as freshmen. We will enrich our community with educational, social, and cultural programs. We have a wonderful performing arts center in you know, St. Paul and Hope. We will offer movies and concerts. We will continue to do that. We'll be regarded as an employer of choice, particularly for those who are interested in working in higher education, will develop career paths, and they'll want to stay with us throughout their careers. We'll assist our students to learn how to learn. One of the things that we constantly hear about in the news is AI or automation, how we students in many industries. So we want to stay on the cutting edge to prepare our students for those jobs that are not even in existence, that they'll have those skills that they'll be ready to put to move into those jobs. We want to expose students to research. We want to give them a leg up. For those who may want to pursue a terminal degree and go into research, we want to provide them with those opportunities and work-based opportunities. <coughs> internships for those students who will be going directly to the work because we know eventually many of those students will be going directly to the work and then lastly we want to help solve problems in the community community is in our name for a reason we work we live we play in the community so we have to help the community grab the problems okay we're starting the clock so, <laughs> So determined and resolute in their faith, their hope, their love, 
knowledge, that they've been able to be trailblazers and will continue to be trailblazers to overcome what seem to be insurmountable odds and to do remarkable things in history. It's a fitting way to end today's talk with you by reciting the Black National Anthem. And you know, in my home church, we had to learn all the verses. So the first week, they would put the, the verse you know, the, on the screens so you could see. And then each week, they would take that one of the verses. So we had to learn this song. So, and I don't know if you know much about James Weldon Johnson. He was a principal of a segregated school in Florida. He sought to write a poem in commemoration of, Af of Abraham Lincoln's birthday. However, amid the ongoing civil rights movement, and for those of you who don't know, you may think of the civil rights movement as just in the 1960s, but they were going to do a march on Washington way back in the 30s. But it didn't come to pass that they were going to do the original march on Washington. So civil rights have been gone on for quite a while. So he sought to write a poem about that. And in the poem, it's a prayer of thanksgiving as well as a prayer for faithfulness and freedom with imagery which evokes the biblical exodus from slavery to the freedom of the promised land. Lift every voice and sing. It was first recited by a group of 500 students in Florida. Johnson wrote that the school children of Jacksonville kept singing it. They went on to other schools and they still started, to, they still would sing it. And they became teachers and they taught it to their students to sing. So within 20 years, it had caught on like wildfire. So they were singing it in the South and all across the country. So this is the first verse. Lift every voice and sing, till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise, high as the listening skies. Let it resound, loud as the rolling sea. Hear our words. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day we come. Let us march on till victory is won with our faith, hope, love, and knowledge. Thank you for your listening here. <laughs> Man, it's just amazing how much stuff you don't, you know, you don't know about when you uh, uh, you hear a presentation like that. We want to thank you from the bottom of our heart. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, y'all, y'all, y'all stand y'all feet and give a uh, uh, standing ovation to that. That's just wonderful to hear about your accomplishments as well. You know, because it's, it, it, it's just impressive. You know. Stand on the shoulders of others. I'm looking forward to all these other people in the room to carry on. Hey, we, we, like that. We, we buddies now. <laughs> we, we buddies now. I'm going to be coming to you for for some help. I mean, we have young people here at our, our church, and I, I, I think that it was it's just wonderful to even hear, hear a presentation like this because. You don't know how much is right over there at uh, at the university over there. Um, with it being newly formed, you know, not not many years, you know, being here in Texas County, I, I've come to uh, work with the university pretty close on the the previous uh, um, chancellor. Uh, he spent a lot of time working with our district, and as a matter of fact, your work, uh, uh, your adult education stuff, it basically came from. Us. He helped us out <laughs> by taking the program to the to the college and and actually uh, taking it over and then then giving it more of an adult education field. We're glad to do that. And that's yeah. why I started my career. Yes. We're we're impressed that that the university is doing so well and and that they have gotten a dynamic uh, a new leader uh, there and especially being the first African American. Uh, uh, female. So I'm excited. I'm excited to say that I'm looking forward to uh, working with you uh, uh, directly in uh, the rest of the school district uh, over here on the Arkansas side. We're looking forward to uh, really working with you. I was kind of mad at them that they came and saw you without me. You know, they 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 set up a meeting and then didn't let me know that they were going. You know, so. Now I've met you. 
I met y'all by myself. <laughs> if there's anybody who hasn't had the opportunity to get to know the Lord, this is your opportunity to go ahead and come forward. Uh, we would be remiss if we didn't uh, offer that opportunity and, and, and let you know that it's not only on Sunday that we do that. The doors of the church are not only open on Sunday. They're always open. I mean, if you see any of us. Now, the physical doors at the building might not be open every day of the week. But you've got to understand that when I speak of the church, I'm not speaking about the building. I'm speaking about all of the inhabitants, all of the people that are in the kingdom of God. We're the church. And we remain open to those who haven't taken that opportunity to go ahead and come into the church and become members, not only at a particular church. I'm not talking about you becoming a member here at 11th Street, but I'm talking about you actually coming into the kingdom of God. Membership has its privileges in the kingdom of God. You guys have to know it. So if you or outside of the ark of safety and you feel like coming, won't you please come? Thank you.
and you heard a uh, wonderful uh, presentation by Dr. Holden. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm overflowing, y'all, because I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities not only for um, our, our, that our university, but for our city, yeah. you know. Uh, do y'all understand how important this was, was yeah. you know, and the things that she talked about, uh, and this should be a message that goes out to young people everywhere uh, about the opportunities that are available to them in college, uh, at the college, and, and to us adults. I mean, she even talked about classes that way we can get involved with. Now, I might go over here and learn me some mortuary science. <laughs> hey, look, you might, you might have gotten you a student. <laughs> out of this stuff, but I'm, I'm just saying that there are opportunities out here for us now, and, uh, and I feel uh, grateful to God for doing this for us. If all hearts are satisfied, if there's uh, nothing else, let's go ahead and stand to our feet. And... I have one person finishing fast. Oh. And I have a closer to Miss Dana, but this is either a gift from your card from uh, it says, Happy Valentine's Day, Pastor Andrew Hill, First Lady Dana Hill. We love you. Seniors in touch and mission sisters. Oh, that's so Uh, Valentine treats for the young folks too as they leave. Okay, all right, y'all young people, y'all hear that? I'm gonna come take y'all candy from you. You know. But uh, if all hearts are satisfied, let's let's go ahead and stand to our feet. I know uh, on this Sunday we were supposed to uh, go ahead and do the installation of our officers. I'm gonna ask y'all to just bear with me and allow me to go ahead and do that on the next next Sunday. So. Um, we can uh, we can go ahead and go through it and get it uh, more planned. Cause I look out into the audience and there are uh, several of our officers that are uh, uh, not able to attend today. So uh, we'll we'll do it on next next Sunday. Uh, let's bow our heads and prepare to uh, dismiss. Oh Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful service, Lord. Thank you for the wonderful speaker of the hour today, Lord. We thank you for blessing her and, and giving us the wisdom and the knowledge and the love and the understanding that you desire to come through that message. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done for us, Lord. We know we couldn't have done anything in our lives if it wasn't for you, Lord. So we just thank you for blessing us beyond compare, Lord. We thank you for loving us even when we did things that made us seem like we were unlovable, Lord. We thank you for just uh, uh, all of the love and care that you've given to each and every person under the sound of my voice, Lord. But those that weren't able to make it out today, Lord, we ask that you go to wherever they are and give them the touch that only you can give them, Lord. A touch that will help them to recover from the sickness that may be coming upon them. A touch that will help them to uh, recover from any problem or any struggle that they may be going through, Lord. We know that you are all-powerful, Lord. You're all-knowing. You're all-seeing. And we love you with all of our hearts, not only for all of the wonderful things that you've done for us, but just because of who you are. Lord, we love you from the bottom of our hearts, Lord. We ask that you fill us with all of those things that we need to go into the highways and byways and compel me into coming to you. Lord. So we're asking that you just order our footsteps. Teach us how to be more like you in everything that we do and everything that we say. And now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of us until we meet again. Let us all say Amen. Amen.